So this is something that uh, one definitely doesn't want to have. But it's very important and this is something that you have to practice in all your surgeries because PCR is something that all of us have. If somebody says that he doesn't have a PCR ever, we have to doubt whether he does any surgery at all. So one thing that you do is you do not shut the irrigation. So if you are in position 3, come to position 1. If you are in position 2, you can come to position 1. Whichever position you are, state you are in, whether it's during IA or FACO, it's important that you do not go to position 0 and shut off the irrigation because the anterior chamber collapses and uh, the vitreous moves forward, the PCR becomes larger and you have vitreous prolapse. Then with the irrigation still on, so your handpiece is still inside, you take whatever OVD you have. If you have uh, one of the, the high-end OVD is fine, otherwise just use HPMC. Go through the side port with your uh, other hand and inject enough viscoelastic to stabilize the anterior chamber. As you're injecting, you shut off the irrigation and you come out of the main wound. So if you have this, fine, but don't wait for it. Just use anything that you have on your table. And what you do after that depends on what stage the PCR happens, early in surgery or later on. And if there's a large amount of nucleus left, you cannot really do anything other than convert to an SICS or ECC, whichever one you're con uh, competent with. If it's a small amount of nucleus left, you can actually do a FACO with a dispersive OVD in place. Sometimes you inject continuously and do the FACO. And if there's a small bit of vitre uh, with vitreous uh, in the anterior chamber, then you have to do vitrectomy. Do not continue with FACO because that will produce a lot of traction on the retina. And if there's only cortex left, do the vitrectomy if needed and then IA. And depends on what sort of a capsule you have left. Uh, you can implant the IOL or sometimes you can even implant IOL earlier before your IA. So this was a brown cataract and it was for a toric IOL and sometimes, so I don't do marking like this anymore, I do it on a uh, slit lamp. But when you do a brown or a black cataract like this, the problem is you relax when you're doing your IA and most IA uh, PCRs happen during IA. So there, I have a PCR and there was a, I was holding the capsule actually with the IA, so I release that with the other hand. Then inject viscoelastic, come out. This is a more dispersive viscoelastic. And I decide to inject, actually there was not even much of cortex left at that stage. So it's not always that you can convert the uh, PCR into a rexis. If there's a small flap, you can do it, otherwise uh, it doesn't work. But then most of the time it's stable and I could actually implant it in the axis because it was small central tear. The other thing that you do not do is we always keep teaching our fellows that, our students that do not polish the posterior capsule in PPC but then we don't follow it always. You know, so we, okay, it's so tiny, nothing's really going to happen. So I've actually finished everything. Even my IA is over. And just for that little bit of posterior capsule opacification, decide to touch it, and there the PC is, there's a hole in the PC. But I had the sense not to shut off my irrigation, inject viscoelastic, and then this was a small flap like tear, so I could convert it into a rexis, a posterior primary uh, posterior capsule rexis. And believe me, it's a lot easier to do a, a rexis on the posterior capsule than it is on the anterior capsule. There are no zonules to pull the capsule, the rexis out. So it's a lot easier. And then you can implant the IOL of your choice. There's absolutely no problem. This is uh, a Technis 1 multifocal IOL. And it's absolutely stable. It goes between uh, the anterior rexis and the posterior rexis. It's very stable. This was a Mogagnon cataract. <clears throat> and as you can see, the uh, over-enthusiastic over marking on the cornea. So Mogagnon cataracts, the thing is, it's a small uh, nucleus. The, the capsule is very, very motile, uh, very mobile. So it really comes forward. And I've caught the capsule. 
सो अगेन आई हैड विस्कोट इन हैंड नो फाइनेंशियल इंटरेस्ट इन दैट आई इंजेक्ट विस्कोट बिहाइंड द न्यूक्लियस देन इट वाज सर्ट ऑफ द न्यूक्लियस वाज इन पोजीशन यू डोंट वांट टू रियली मैनिपुलेट इट टू मच एट दैट पॉइंट सो आई जस्ट मूव इट इनटू अ प्लेस वेयर आई कैन इमल्सिफाई इट इजीली एंड वंस इट्स डन आई कैन इंप्लांट द आयल इनटू द बैग सो द इंपॉर्टेंट लेसन इज दैट यू डू नॉट remove your or stop your irrigation pull out your hand piece all of a sudden and then you really can't implant the premium ioles because they won't go into the bag anymore uh this was uh, one of my earlier cases it's a very intimescent uh, cataract uh, really huge patient bull neck must have weighed about 120 130 kilos so there was a lot of pressure uh during surgery and here if you see like i said it's in the, one of my earlier cases so you saw that i hadn't injected viscoelastic when i came out this is not something that i would do at all and because of that the vitreous did come to the front it was a very soft cataract there was almost no nucleus so i could actually uh, just aspirate out the rest of the nucleus uh, do a vitrectomy and after doing doing a proper vitrectomy you can actually uh, do your i there is absolutely no problem and then implant the lens there was sufficient capsule there was a large uh, capsule if you see on your on your screen on the left side and this was actually a t9 so the highest uh, uh, astigmatic correction so i couldn't actually place it absolutely in axis that probably would have made it a little unstable the haptics but then it was about 10 degrees off but then in a t9 he was still happy because uh it's uh, such a large astigmatism that had to be corrected and this was a very large ppc so when you see something like this such a large ppc you can actually expect the pc to go at some point of time so i'm removing the epinucleus now and that's when the pc opens up so as you see i'm even holding on to the epinucleus on my phaco tip so i'm still in position 2 not in position 3 because if i leave it is going to go into the vitreous so once i inject viscoelastic then i visco express it out do a vitrectomy uh, do a proper vitrectomy you have to practice all these vitrectomy and all in all your routine cases there's nothing like a vanas vitrectomy or a sponge vitrectomy nowadays you have to have an automated vitrector even if you are doing an sics uh, you cannot really do a sponge or a vectus vitrectomy and once you do that as you can see the one indication that you can of, of course use transil alone but the one indication that your vitreous is fully out is that your co cortex comes out very very easily after that and once that happens i can implant it's a three piece uh, intraocular lens i can't implant a single piece lens because this is going to go into the sulcus not into the bag but you get a technis three piece multifocal lens so we had planned for that knowing that the pc will probably rupture and then the important thing is you do a optic capture in the rexus so that the power doesn't change so you just tilt one uh pole under the haptic uh, under the rexus and then the other one also and that's very stable thank you I'll go on with. All right. Uh, is there anyone who has any questions? If not, then I have one. Just anybody else? Any question? So here's my question to the panel. Now, when you go to patient with a polar cataract, and it's a fairly, uh, you know, the polar cataract that's kind of talking to you and saying, "Hey, I'm going to open up." What do you do when a patient uh, asks for a multifocal lens here? Aru Get the next ready for me. Okay. We'll start exactly in 4 minutes. Hey, this is this does not work. No? You can speak just like that. Um because you know we're recording all the sessions so the dynamic. Asidu stand this here. Then please come and have a seat here and speak. This is working now. Working now. When you drop it, it worked. 
See, uh, most of these uh, uh, patients with posterior polar cataract, uh, they present to us quite early. You know, they're very active, and uh, multifocality is a very important aspect of their pseudophagic post. Uh, post pseudophagic rehabilitation so i think in what I'd, i have done multifocal for those these patients also but i tell them that if i have a intraoperative posterior capsule rent and uh, i have opened up the vitretum has been done i may go for a traditional lens so okay. appropriate counseling is absolutely important okay. they should know that you know there will be a situation where you know they have to adjust to pseudophagic uh, presbyopia perfect is there any other point you'd like to add Dr. yeah it depends a lot on what's the first eye or the second eye so if it's a second eye and you, uh, I mean, if it's a second eye, you've done a multifocal already in one eye and you got away with it, the chances are that you'll get away with it in the next eye also. But that's also yes, a bigger just, challenge, just, right? I, I know, I, I'm, I'm coming to that. So the counseling begins in the first eye itself. That yes, if you're willing for multifocal, we'll go ahead, understand the risks. If we can do a multifocal in the first eye, we take the same chances and go ahead for the second eye. Depending upon how the situation unfolds in the second eye, we might have to take a call and change course. You may have a multifocal in one eye and a monofocal in the other eye. That's good. That's pretty good. We do that now routinely. Uh, indications for multifocal have been changing. And uh, uh, oftentimes, we, if the patient has a monofocal in one eye and understands the uh, pros and cons, we do put do a multifocal in the other eye. So that's... My, my, my question... Yeah, I think anyway, even if it's the second eye, we have to tell them that there is a possibility that we may not be able to put in a multifocal in one eye and it may go in in the other. It, I have a question, Dr. Minu. Uh, one, one thing is, I show them their cataract in the video monitor yeah. and then show the types of cataracts on my, my screen and then tell them that this is what is peculiar about you because that is what will make them understand that there is a peculiar type of cataract in their eye. Then they will understand point. it much better and they will yeah. take it. What you, otherwise, they'll think sometimes that you have created a problem and then not implanted as lens and all those. So visually, if they, if I make it clear, it is better. I make it a point to note another file also. <laughs> the risks of posterior polar cataract explained, counseled and explained. So is, uh, are, are the three-piece multifocal IELTS still available? We used to call for them from Chennai, so is that not an option that you undercorrect for because it's going to be slightly myopic if it's going to be in the sulcus? It's going to be the same power if it's going to be in the sulcus with a posterior optic capture. Is it a good idea to even consider keeping a three-piece multifocal standby, especially in the second eye and even if in the first? I always have a full set of inventory in my own. Yeah, we don't get them in Bombay. We could order them what? from Chennai. Sensor, sensor is available. Is though. that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not very easily available, I, as far as I know. Well, you're talking about multifocal, multifocal three I'm talking about a three-piece multifocal. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's I think it's a great idea. I know Alcon makes them. I know they're available in Chennai. We should find out wh where are our local distributors that can organize those. Should there be someone who's picky and wanting a multifocal IL? I still think that that should be, could be a consideration, all right? 